Oh, hello there. To be a fly on the wall in a meeting between the Spotify execs and their $100 million mega podcaster, Joe Rogan. A lot of people are looking to dethrone the podcast king, but at least according to Spotify CEO, that ain't going to happen. He is not planning to fire him. Here to help break it all down, comedian Dwayne Kennedy, uh, supervising producer of United Shades of America with Camo Bell. Uh, and also with us, Ben Ferguson, host of The Ben Ferguson Show and The Ben Ferguson Podcast. Welcome to both of you. So um, I've set that Thank up best here. I can, of course, without playing the thing that's, you know, kind of upsetting everybody on, you know, on the World Wide Web. And that is this uh, yeah. montage. So let, let's start with you, Dwayne. I just wanted to get your reaction generally to the, to the montage, uh, to the, uh, the intent behind whoever put the montage out there. And then the reaction from from Joe, and then the reaction from Spotify. Well, I mean, that's Joe. Everybody who knows Joe Rogan knows that's that's been him for his, his career. So I'm not I'm not surprised, um, you know, that he's contrite now. I mean, I think it's just it's just a money thing, you know. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to lose my my uh, contract or whatever it is with Spotify. So I come out and make this statement, but you know, I'm not. I'm not surprised. He's it, and, it's, and it's happened. It happened years ago. Um, I don't. I don't think Spotify was concerned. Obviously, I mean they didn't. I'm sure they vetted them. It, it wasn't an issue till it be, till people made it an issue. You know, I don't. I don't think it, it matters one way or another. It's just business for them, at all. You know, I don't. I don't, business. I don't yeah, think big they have business. It. Yeah, big business. Big business. Yeah, they yeah, have. They have elbows. no moral investment in that one way or another. So I think what, you know, Ben, what Dwayne just said really is interesting. It's like, yeah, he's been saying it. It's years and years old. And I'm looking at a guy who's been pretty famous for a long time, right? He was, yeah. he was fear well, factor. Uh, he had, uh, uh, he was, uh, what, what was the other thing he did? Uh, the, he was a touring comedian. UFC. He also did play by play for UFC. Yeah, UFC. So it's not like yeah. he's, but, but, he's a famous he, guy. Here's, typically here's the when thing. you're a famous guy, they find this early. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. This this is why I'm so sick of the elite. And I just say to all these cancel culture people, screw you. OK, I want to be on record as saying that because Joe Rogan is exactly what you got when you paid for him, Spotify. And everybody in America that listens to him is not shocked by this. The reason why he has more people listen to him than ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, their nightly primetime lineup combined daily is because people like listening to a guy that doesn't act like he's better than everybody else and he's a comedian when i go watch a comedian i know they're going to be offensive and he's a comedian that decided to do a podcast when no one knew what a podcast was so is this shocking to me it is not and the people that listen to him are not shocked by this the people now that are virtue signaling and the stars that are trying to become more famous by saying, I'm canceling, I'm no longer going to be on Spotify. I mean this sincerely. I don't give a crap about your music. Take it wherever the hell you want to. But there also is a problem with Spotify, and it's this. R. Kelly's music tonight is still on Spotify. Why is no one trying to cancel his music when he's a guy in prison for the rest of his life as a pedophile? How is it that Joe Rogan, a guy who smokes weed on set is offending everyone, who's a comedian, but R. Kelly's music, no one talks about. It's because it's absurd. If you don't like somebody, turn off their podcast. If you don't like their music, turn off their music. But stop trying to destroy people's lives so you feel better about yourself when pretty much most of these people trying to destroy him are scumbags, in my opinion. I'm sick of these people. Well, it's interesting, oh. Dwayne, about, you know, there's Whoopi Goldberg getting two weeks uh, suspension. Vacation. Um, for having said it, something. No, it's a vacation. Well. It, call it a vacation. Ben, it's your, a vacation. your vacation is another person's humiliation, okay? <laughs> I mean, this is a big deal, you know? Wh Whoopi got really slapped by this, and, you know, she didn't use the N-word. She said something else that upset a lot of people oh. about her views of the Holocaust and race. But I just sort of wonder, like, it doesn't necessarily play laterally for everybody. This uh, must right. be punished it, business because I don't see any right. punishment at all for Joe Rogan. That's the thing. What does it say that one person gets rewarded and one person gets suspended? Why is that? I, why is it not equitable? 
And I think that has something to do with racism, with sexism. You know, when 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 clearly to me, Whoopi Goldberg, Whoopi Goldberg was not being malicious. She was misguided, perhaps, but her intent was not malicious. So why did she get two weeks off? And all Joe Rogan gets is um, affirmed publicity. I'm sure his his listenership is just going to grow. So that's what I don't agree well, with. You know, who, with with all due respect, that, though, let me he let got me an offer. About, he got an offer from a Canadian company called Rumble. Well, there you go. And, yeah. and, and uh, a, a, Peter, a company Peter that realized they could take a huge headline by offering a contract that they know he's not going to take. It was a brilliant PR move for a free speech platform that says, hey, we're the opposite of censorship like YouTube. Come over to Rumble. It was a brilliant business move by then to put this out there. Uh, everybody knew when it went out there that Joe Rogan's not going to move over there. And that's why Rumble made the offer. But the difference between Whoopi and Joe Rogan is this. Whoopi's on a daytime talk show that is constantly talking about canceling people and being offended by everything. Then she says something offensive, has an opportunity to apologize for it, and bungles it. Then goes on a nighttime talk show on the competitor who tries to save her, and she bungles it again and tries to tell people that the Holocaust was not about race when it was about race if you quote Adolf Hitler. And she gets a two-week vacation and got to keep her job. If you put in perspective about what she said about Jewish people in America, that I, I think she should be very happy. There's no racism here. They kept her, they protected her, and they gave her two weeks off. Not a bad gig for what she did. Well, she's also, you know, she's also financially critical, right, Dwayne? Like Whoopi's also just like Joe Rogan. She's really important to the view. They can't afford to lose someone of her star power. Right, and to say that she was being offensive, suddenly that's, you know, subjective and, and as a Jewish person, but Whoopi Not herself Jewish is people. Jewish. Whoopi herself is Jewish, sir, so, you know. If, if, if so let me ask Goldberg, this, and just by the way, we, we kind of breezed over said. that. We, we kind of breezed over the Canadian offer, and the print was really little, but I do want people to know what this group rumbled. It's a, it's a bit of a right-leaning you know, right uh, Canadian video platform, and what they said was, we stand with you, you know, Joe Rogan, uh, your guests and your legion of fans in, in desire for real conversation. How about you bring all your shows to rumble, both new and old, with no censorship for 100 million bucks over four years. This is our yeah. chance to save the world, and yes, this is totally legit. So interesting. I, I think you're right. Uh, Ben, great PR Smart move on, on their move. behalf. So business, I want to ask you about uh, business here, guys. And that is that um, some people say, uh, let the free market speak on this stuff. Don't don't go all cancel culture. Some people say asking for cancel culture is part of the free market. But the real markets had something to say about Spotify. Let me put up some of the raw numbers. Before all of this business started, uh, February 1st, Spotify stock was at $204 and some change. And then February 3rd, a couple days later, this is after Neil Young and Joni Mitchell's protests. It it just like plummeted to 158 bucks. Now here we are, Feb 7, right? It's a week after the original price. It's recovered a little. It's it's just way below where it should have been. So Ben, what are your thoughts about that? You can't say yeah. to the stock market, I, oh, quit canceling. The stock market's the stock market. It's the free market, right? Well, well, look, the stock markets are emotional, and when you see something like this, you have people that hedge bets. I can tell you what I did. I bought Spotify for the first time because I knew the people that were pulling out are going to put their money back in, and it's and, and it's absurd that the stock was affected this much knowing that they weren't going to let Joe Rogan go. And here's the the, the part that is going to be, the, the I think, the best thing about all of this is there are going to be more people than ever before that end up listening to Joe Rogan now and in the future because of all the attention. And the people that hate Joe Rogan the most are the people that have never listened to him. The people that I've talked to that have never listened to Rogan before who just started in the last week and a half, they actually like him and think he's funny because when you hear his show and you hear what he does, they actually understand him as a human being and realize the, the, the boogeyman, this is the worst man in the world, and all this other stuff that people have been putting on him is just not reality for who Joe Rogan is. He's going to end up laughing all the way to the bank when all this is done. 
So, Dwayne, button this up for me, uh, just sort of bringing in like what the medical professionals all said, you know, uh, about the COVID information he was in, some say misinformation that he was doling out. There were 270 of them that penned an open letter saying, stop this. This is dangerous. This is costing people's lives. And a lot of people ask the question, and I guess we could, you know, dovetail it into this debate too. Do people just have the right to be stupid or wrong or loud or, yes. uh, or, or learn from their mistakes <laughs> or do we or do we need to you know bring the the pliers and squeeze it out of them no i mean right certainly everybody's got a right to be well that's the thing you do have a right to be stupid and loud and ignorant but some people get rewarded for that and some people get punished that's the difference and i would say if people are fighting so hard so that joe rogan can say whatever it is he wants to say then don't be disinclusive of people who are talking about critical race theory or 1619 project include all the information let people be open to information or or words whatever they are you know don't cancel one and exalt the other or exalt one and cancel the other that's my issue you know joe rogan can say whatever yeah. he wants to say but there are uh, actually I, I Just have quick to say ben, one it up, thing yep. about these episodes that that everybody was freaking out over it's really two episodes if you go back and listen to those episodes all joe rogan did was ask questions and it should never get you fired from a job to ask questions when we know how screwed up our response to COVID has been and how many mistakes have been made by the CDC, even on just the basic effectiveness of masks, which he was asking questions about. And yeah, now they've even admitted finally today well, that they screwed up on masks and the effectiveness of parents, the CDC did question. today. That wasn't a Good question listen, when he said is, he thought he was it, visiting Planet of the Apes. That wasn't a question. That, that, was that, that's the other I, part I of said, it all. I said the, the two episodes about the, COVID, yeah. which is why everybody right. wanted to cancel him. This is a longer conversation if we're going to dig, dig down into the COVID stuff, but I so appreciate both of you tonight. Thank you, Dwayne Kennedy. It's good to see you. And Ben Ferguson, thank Thanks, you as guys. well. It's always great to see both great. of you, thank and I you. hope you both come back. Good to see you all. Okay. Sure. So, listen, you cannot even talk about the music scene or the entertainment world uh, or even any pop culture without referencing the remarkable contributions of a man named Kanye West. To some, he is the best thing that ever happened to both, and to others, he's a self-absorbed, egomaniacal rapper who for some reason thought he could be president. Uh, regardless, there is a certain magic behind the name Kanye, or Yeezy, or Ye. <laughs> he does go by them all. And there is no mistaking the astonishing influence that he has had on the world of music. There are two people who know more about Kanye than maybe even Kanye himself, because they've been following him for 20 years and documenting his every move. Cootie Simmons and Chike Oza are award-winning filmmakers whose latest project is a three-part documentary about Kanye West called Genius. Yes, spelled like that. And it covers everything from Kanye's music career to his struggles with mental illness to his run for the White House. The first installment of the doc premieres on Netflix on Feb 16, but Kudi and Chike are here now. Welcome to both of you and thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you for sure. Happy yeah, to be you here. Have us. Absolutely. Well, I think you guys were just listening to the last segment. So before we dig into all of your awesome stuff, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you what you think about, you know, this Joe Rogan stuff and uh, and the, the, you know, the compilation tape that's going out there with the N-bomb over and over again. So, Cody, we'll start with you. What do you think? Oh, well, um, I, I don't pay attention to, like, uh, all of that. Um, so I'm just not hearing about it right now. It's funny. It's funny that I was watching it. We've been so busy with this movie and, you know, getting it out, uh, which February 10th, it, it'll be in, in theaters. So, but I, I, I really don't know much about it. It's just something so new. So, Cootie, doesn't that tell you that, that I have a great show? Like, you're sitting there waiting to be interviewed. You're like, hey, this is a pretty good segment. <laughs> oh, no, I'm I dying have you as a viewer from now. <laughs> <laughs> JK, what do you think? Uh, you know, here's a guy who has, you know, millions and millions of followers and fans and listeners, and it surfaces that he's been dropping the N-bomb and thought it was okay to do so and now has to come out and apologize. And Spotify's taken all those episodes now off and won't let anybody hear them. And, you know, everyone's talking about it, and some people are mad and some people aren't. Like, like Cooney, just walking into that because we've been so busy today. But I know one thing, we're not going to let that hijack all this positivity we're about to bring to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some, there's some really impressive work you guys have done here. And, you know, the thing about Kanye is he's 
kind of this like paradox. He's he's a puzzle. He's 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 like a moving thing. He's an amoeba. He's always changing. There's something always going on with him. Could we start with like the project itself and this like why you even started 20 years ago when Kanye was not Kanye? Yeah, well, um, I would run into Kanye in Chicago on the South Side. He would come up to the barber shop with his with his uh, beats, and I just noticed how talented he was, you know, and and how charismatic he was. And I had a TV show called Channel Zero. So when I, I was the host actually first, and when I started the, um, to, you know, be behind the camera, I seen this this documentary called Hoop Dreams. Um, and I said, but I said, I'm gonna do a Hoop Dreams documentary on Kanye, because I, I just wanted to see his growth and what he was gonna do, but I just knew he was gonna win Grammys. I knew that. So that was the start of it, you know. So that's it. I mean, you saw a kid uh, who just had all the magic that is what you need to put into the, the saucepan to make the star. You knew it right away and you thought, I'm going to get ahead of this and just start rolling, rolling tape. And Chikwe, how did you, you get into this, Chikwe? How did you decide, yeah, this is something I think I need to be part of too? Well, I connected with, with Cootie some years later when um, he came to MTV and a uh, our producer, uh, Yasmin Richards, introduced us. She was producing the You Hear First that was introducing Kanye to the world via MTV. And Cootie had amassed all this footage, the documentary footage she had started shooting. So she introduced us. And I was at MTV, especially because I wanted to make music videos. And that's how we connected. She introduced Cootie to me. We kicked it off for a little bit. And he, he called me when Kanye actually had a car accident. They had gone back to LA. And he called me on the phone. And he's like, he's like, well, we got this idea for this music video we want to do for Kanye. We don't have any money. But we got this idea and I was like, come on, let's go. This is what I'm here for. And that, that, that started our relationship. But it's ironic that our relationship started off of the same footage that now 21 years we're bringing to you, you know, so it's pretty ironic. 21 years. I mean, that's a lot of reels, you know, yeah. that's a lot of, that's a lot of tapes, a lot of film. I mean, well, you know, for, for months, I, you know, been, you know, communicating with Kanye and, um, and letting him know what we were doing. And I told him he had to have 100% trust in me the same way he did um, when we, when me and Chica got together and did Through the Wire, you know, and and he um, and he had that 100% trust, you know, and when that came out, it just, you know, I didn't understand it, but I, like I, like I told him, I said, uh, you know, God really got the final, the final cut, you know, the, the story's still going on as we speak, but we, uh, we have a beautiful doc, the doc is, you know, about, it's about everybody recognizing their genius. It's not Kanye being a genius. It's not me being a genius or Chike. We all have a genius in us. So that's the message for the doc. And, um, and, and God is the, is like I say, Jesus, Jesus direct and God right. So, and, um, and when I seen him last in LA, he was excited about the doc. So, well, Jesus and, and God make their way into a courtroom all the time because we always have to put our hands on a Bible and swear. So, GK, let me ask you, <laughs> is this something where Kanye is going to, you know, is he mad? Does he not think it's going to be, um, you know, uh, a positive, uh, beneficial to his image? Is he, is he threatening? Is he sending cease and desist letters? Is he saying, I'm going to sue you if you release it? Like, how, what's the status of this in terms of where he's at? You know, I'm not sure, like, I'm not in his head, really, so I'm not sure exactly from his point of view, but for me, I mean, everything we're hearing from Kanye is what makes him such a polarizing person. We wouldn't even be, this documentary, this documentary wouldn't be so highly anticipated. So it's not like we were caught off guard, you know? We're just excited to, to tell this doc, and we, we know the impact that it's going to make. I haven't seen it yet, but yeah. everything I've been looking at, all the advance seems to like be pretty flattering. So, um, he, he, you know, listen, you cannot be perfect. So you've got to allow documentaries to show the warts and all if anyone's going to believe any yeah. of it. Guys, Absolutely. I have to fit in a quick break, but I, I want to ask you after the break a little bit about, you know, Kanye's personal relationships. Uh, certainly the Kim Kardashian story has been like pow, huge, you know, all of a sudden it's pretty volatile and there's all sorts of things being said. And then there's that whole running for president business. Um, big question is, how much of it is real? How much of it is for show? And how much of it should we be worried about? All those questions coming up next. Welcome back to Banfield. I am with Kudi and Chike, the filmmakers behind the new epic documentary about Kanye West called 
Genius. I love the way you spell it. Um, first installment of the three-part documentary premieres on February 16th. Right? That's the right date, right? The premieres on February 16th, guys? Yeah, on Netflix, yep. Yeah. But we are uh, we don't okay. want it there this February 10th. I'm putting a calendar entry um, in my phone because I am so looking forward to seeing this. He, I find him so mystifying, some of his behavior. Um, and the whole Kardashian, you know, uh, it was like a pop culture movement. It, I couldn't quite get my head around it all. And then I couldn't get my head around this, the split. Cody, I want to ask you a little bit about all the time you spent with him. Is he a public person? Does he share his private you know, relationships and what's going on in his head. I mean, what do you make of this whole business with him and Kim together and then him and Kim separated? Well, since I've been with Kai, I know him to be pretty private. You know, he, um, you know, it's like this documentary is, is like through my perspective of like how I seen Kanye and, and Chica has a, a great way of uh, explaining how my camera represent empathy, you know, and um, so it was six years when me and Kanye wasn't around. So I, I wasn't there when he like met Kim or, you know, I, I wasn't at the wedding, but, um, you know, I just, um, I just, you know, I just know he loved his kids and, um, and he loved her. So I, I you know, I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, I just pray, I just pray for, for him and his family, you know, so. Do you feel like, and Chiki, maybe you can, you know, weigh in on this. Do you feel like the the guy that you were with as he was coming up into his own, you know, you saw the superstar talent in raw form and then you saw it honed into the megawatt celebrity that he is and the megawatt celebrities he's surrounded with. Is he the same guy now as as you guys knew back then and, and as you began your documenting of his life? I mean, the moments that we share with them, you know, and that's what we're so excited about, at least for this documentary, in the sense of like, a lot of people would, they only have met Kanye through the media and they get an opportunity to meet now Kanye through Cootie's lens. And uh, I think the side of Kanye you'll see through his lens is, uh, is different and you know, contextualized a lot about Kanye. It's not here to change your opinion about Kanye. Um, we're not making a commercial for Kanye, but it will give you some context and, 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 a, and, a, and, some, and a glimpse inside. Uh, elements of Kanye that you might not have ever seen before. So I want to show this one clip that it shows him rapping with uh, some friends. I mean, this is just really freestyling and it, uh, I think it really proves the point of just the ultimate purest talent that is just overwhelmingly massive inside one body. Take a look at this. I am limelight, blueprint, five mics, go get his rhyme like, should have been signed twice. Most imitated, Grammy nominated, hotel accommodated, cheerleader prom dated, barbershop player hated, mom and pop bootlegged it. Felt like the rain to the roof caved in, but two words, shot town, raised me crazy. So I live by two words, F you pay me, screaming, uh -huh. Jesus save me. You know how the game be, I can't let them change me, cause on judgment day, you gon' blame me. Now we get racially profiled, cuffed up and hose down, pimped up and hold down. Plus, I got a whole city to hold down from the bottom, so the top's the only place to go now. You can see the, the look on the faces of his friends, you know, and people in that room. They're all just a bit blown away because that was just riffing. I mean, it is really remarkable. Cody, yeah. is that, was that just standard? Was that just normal for him? He was just that good all the time. Well, on this scene, most deaf, this is first time hearing Kanye's verse. And, you know, Kanye would rap that way to anybody and everybody. He, he, he It'd be two people in a room and he'd rap like there's a, a, a stadium full of people. You know, he's so passionate about about his, you know, his talent. He's so passionate about his, the things that he have to say, the things he want to get out to the world. And then that just shows right here in this clip. You know, that's Wood Harris in the room uh, from Chicago. So... You know, he, he's just that type of guy, man. And, and it's, it's great to see him, you know, in that light. So, yeah, I mean, in that light, 
there's a there's a, a bar on the bottom of the screen saying yes or no is Kanye West a genius and that answer is yes when you look at that there's just no question about it and now I'm going to show another clip of him that I think a lot of news viewers were kind of like open jawed and could not figure out what they were watching it was Kanye in the Oval Office with President Trump uh, let's take a look at that I want to ask you about it on the other side take a peek this is our president. He has to be the freshest, the flyest, the flyest planes, the best factories. And we have to make our core be in power. We have to bring jobs into America. GK, that moment was just like, whoa. Um, and, you know, he had uh, admitted that he was suffering from bipolar, I think, in 2017. But his mental health seems to be a very big question, and certainly that Oval Office moment showed some very unusual behavior. What do you make of, of what is inside Kanye, and if maybe some of that mental struggle that he's had has been the root of some of his genius? Um, I mean, I, yeah, I definitely can't speak on Kanye mentally. I, I'm no doctor or whatnot, but I, I definitely, um, you know, like a lot of amazing artists, you know, Kanye's a complex person. And again, I, I can never speak from what's going on inside of his mind, you know, but like I said, our documentary is here to bring color and context to just other sides of Kanye that you haven't seen before. And maybe some of that color will you'll be able to, you know, get a better understanding of who he is as a person. Yeah. I can't wait. Uh, February 16th, everybody. It's called Genius, uh, the story of, uh, of Kanye West. It's something to, something to behold. Kuni and Chike, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you. Peace, sir. Peace. Yeah. Good to have you guys, and good luck with the doc. Okay, still ahead, uh, I'm gonna switch gears completely. A story about a murder of uncommon cruelty by a man of uncommon depravity. It took an FBI mind hunter to bring this man, Larry Bell, to justice, and I'm not gonna tell you how he did it. He's gonna tell you himself when we come back. Welcome back. Sherry Faye Smith was two days shy of her high school graduation in Lexington, South Carolina, when a man she knew from around town approached her at her family's mailbox. The Smiths had a big plot of land, and the mailbox was a long way from the house. It was May 31st, 1985, and Sherry never again set foot inside that house. Her dad found her car at the end of that long driveway, the engine still running and the driver's side door wide open. Sherry's purse was still in the car and her wallet was still in the purse, along with her medication, and Sherry was severely diabetic. Her family was frantic, and for two days and nights, police were left literally without a clue until the calls started coming in to the Smith family home. The first one, promising a letter from Sherry, was on the way, and this is the letter, handwritten, titled, Last Will and Testament. Though the only thing that Sherry was actually willing to her faith-filled church-going family was peace. She assured them with a nod to her savior that, quote, I'll be with my father now, so please, please don't worry. Please don't ever let this ruin your lives. That letter, that will, just may have been in Sherry's mother's hands when a call came in from the sadistic killer. Did you receive the letter today? Ah, uh, yes, I did. Tell me one thing it said. Tell you one thing it said? Anything. Uh, Sorry. How many pages? Two pages. Okay, it was a yellow legal pad. Yeah. And on one side on the front page it said, Jesus is love. No, God is love. Well, God is love. Right. Okay, so you know now that this is not a hoax call. No, definitely it wasn't a hoax. Sherry's captor was toying with Sherry's mom. For what purpose? Only he knew. But it also was not a ransom demand. Not one of the calls that he made was. And to experts like John Douglas, that was bad news. Douglas was a profiler with the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, and the Lexington County Sheriff needed his help on the case. Douglas surmised that Sherry Smith's captor was most likely young and white and somewhat overweight, had been married but wasn't now, was intelligent with some knowledge of gadgets. 
That's because he altered his voice on the phone calls. There were eight calls in total, and they came even after Sherry's body was found, even after her funeral. Sherry was found June 5th, six days after she vanished, behind a Masonic Lodge, 18 miles out of town, exactly where the caller had said she would be found. His favorite person to talk to in the Smith household was Sherry's big sister, Dawn, and it was to Dawn that he said this, completely unprompted, almost impossible to fathom. Can you handle if I tell you how she died? Yes. Okay, now be strong. Now. Okay. She said she knew you were. She told me all about the family and everything. We talked and, oh God. And I am a family friend. That's the sad part. You are a family friend? Yeah. And that's why I can't face y'all. She died. Can you handle this now? Yes. Okay, I tied her up to the bedpost and uh, with electric uh, cord and uh, she didn't struggle cry or anything. She let me voluntarily from her chin to her head. Oh yeah, and be sure to tell. Okay, I'll go ahead and take. And I took duct tape and wrapped it all the way around her head and suffocated her and tell the coroner or get the information that's how she died. And another ironic part, I had to see what was going on at the house, at your house. Yes. I was there Saturday morning for the search. You were at the search Saturday? Yes, I was. And it, oh God, Don, I wish, I, I wish y'all could help me, but it's just too late. Let me tell you something, okay? God can forgive you. Well, I have to go now, Don, I know there. And through God, we can forgive you also. Could you forgive the man who raped and suffocated your sister, your daughter, and then called you to twist the knife? Even if you could, the FBI does not work that way. With the help from that document, that very will that Sherry was forced to write just before he killed her, and with the help from Sherry's sister herself, John Douglas and the other authorities brought Larry Jean Bell to justice. Bell was a local man, white, 35 years old, was divorced with one child, and an electrician by trade. He indeed knew gadgets, and he knew electricity. Also ironic because he died in South Carolina's electric chair in 1996. But only after committing at least one more act of savagery. And when we come back, you'll hear how Bell was caught and what he did after killing Sherry from John Douglas the original FBI mind hunter. Stay with us. A new book is When a Killer Calls, a haunting story of a murder, criminal profiling, and justice in a small town. John Douglas, it's good to have you. Thank you. You know, um, the, I Thank had you. chills even, you know, going through that, that setup, um, uh, you know, and Sherry's killer was so incredibly twisted not that most serial killers aren't but what do you think drove him to make those calls and twist that knife the way he did i i never had a, a case like this i mean like dennis rader you mentioned the btk strangler he contacted the police and the local media david burke was the son of sam did the same thing the zodiac did that you know as well he's this is he's a sadist he's a sadistic serial killer just the way he he killed sherry face smith and by giving her a choice, she could die of uh, suffocation, she could die of gunshot or uh, drug overdose, and she selected uh, suffocation and went through all the gory details with the family, the whole time giving the family the false hope. What was made it easier for me to do the profile, or it was pretty darn detailed, was because we had a voice. And, we, and, and from the voice, we could tell you know, his background. We knew he'd be a white male. And to commit a crime like this, you don't do this as a first crime. You would have a criminal history. And we provided that information as well, the type of crimes that he would perpetrate prior to this particular case. And we, we felt he probably is good for other murders. And he is suspect in two other murders. Uh, but what I did with Dawn, I coached Dawn to ha how to keep uh, him on the phone as long as possible using hostage negotiating skills like paraphrasing, restatement of content. But it was really, it was frightening for the family when I so suggested that Dawn, I wanted to use Dawn as bait. Why? Because you could see from the calls he was now focusing 
you know, on, on dawn. And so that's where I came up with a memorial service that was going to be, be held in a day or two. And I met with an investigative reporter who would write about it. And I told her how I wanted her to poetically describe everything that's taken place. And when I went to Sherry Smith's room, I saw she collected koala bears and I found a real small one, about two or three inches. And I'm thinking ahead of proactively, I'm going to have her place, Dawn place that on a flower stem at the gravesite. Now, why am I going to do that? Because of the research I was finding is that the killers will go back to the grave sites for various reasons, to, to symbolically roll in the, in the dirt, not for, uh, for remorse uh, at all, but, but really they're inadequate nobodies like this killer here. And for the first time in his life, this inadequate nobody feels like a somebody. And so we had it all staked out. And if we didn't catch him the way we will eventually catch him, and that is through that last will and testament, we would have got him uh, because he pulled up at the grave site and we had the license plates of people who were stopping and we would have done a criminal check on him and we would have eventually got his name. But probably and dangerously, he could have committed a couple of more murders before we did get, a, get him. But we were able to get him another way. With the legal pad, which I find so amazing that that note was written when in the imprint had a phone number, which you were able to track to an elderly couple who, when you told them about the profile, they said, oh, it's definitely Larry Jean Bell. I only have 30 seconds left, yeah. but did you ever get a chance to talk to him? Yes, I did. I got to, uh, unexpectedly, they brought him into the room. And what I, I did was, uh, <laughs> wasn't planning to do this, sat him down and I, I I didn't have an interrogation with him. I didn't have an interview. I had a conversation with him and I, I needed to provide a face saving scenario. And what he would confess to during you know, this going back and forth was that the the good Larry Jean Bell sitting here never could have perpetrated a crime like this. Oh. But the ba oh. bad, the bad Larry Jean Bell could have. And that's oh, how we, we just, got the confession uh, and, you know, and I testified to that. Well, thank God for that. And thank you for your work. And John, it's a great book. I mean, my goodness, I, I, when a killer calls, the haunting story thank of murder, you. criminal profiling, and justice in a small town. I know you've got so many fans that this thing's going to fly off the shelf. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate it. So this got us thinking how many serial killers are active in the U.S. After the break, you'll hear and you may be surprised. Before the break, I asked you how many serial killers are active in the U.S. and your choices are 100, 800, or 2,000. And I'll bet you wouldn't believe it, but the answer is C, 2,000, according to the Murder Accountability Project. So be careful out there. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.